for. But you do have an exam next week, and part of what's certainly on the exam is the wet lab we're going to be doing in the PLO gel, and it's not that bad. It's an easy <coughs> dosage form to make. I think a lot of you uh, will do fine making it as long as you understand the calculations and so forth. But we got two dosage forms, and they're kind of related, and I'm trying to get this thing moved down. Uh, we're going to start off with the motion. So look at the dry lab. And again, get your calculators out if you don't. We're going to do some calculations. But look at the first prescription for the dry lab. Okay. So I think you'll see it's for Mark Sawyer. And it's for mineral oil. Okay. Uh, don't you guys, do you sell mineral oil in the pharmacy? Yeah, they do sell mineral oil in the pharmacy, right? What aisle is it in? In the laxative aisle, right? It helps if you can't get it out. Mineral oil will help it slide out, right? It works actually very effective laxative. Do you sell a lot of it? Why not? Okay, so what we are doing today, if you look on there, is to take mineral oil and to mix it with some cherry syrup. What possible reason is that? Well, I thought, well, I, so I'm going to show you a quick little video on why somebody would compound this oral emulsion. So using castor oil as an example, let's see, this, hopefully we'll say it better than anything I can say. Not going to have a bunch of sick children on my hands. Uh-oh, here it comes. Come on, line up. Well, at least we're at the end of the line. Yeah, maybe it'll run out before she gets to us. About! Hey! Open your mouth. Open your mouth! Open! Stop it! So why are we taking mineral oil and mixing it with some cherry syrup? To make it not go like that girl did, right? So a lot of times, a lot of oils especially are very objectionable in the mouth, especially if you're talking about something that needs to be taken internally or orally. And it coats the mouth, it's oil, it's slimy, it just is terrible. So what we are talking about in your dry lab today is an oral emulsion for the full purpose of trying to make it more palatable. I'm not palatable. going to have a bunch yeah, of... I want to watch it again. Now, and that's what we're focusing on today. Now, in a couple of weeks, when we do creams and ointments, that's where we're going to spend a lot of time on emulsions again, because instead of an oral emulsion, what kind of emulsions are those? Those are topical. But all of your semi-solids, most of your creams and ointments used are basically emulsions. So again, we'll, we'll come back to this topic back then. So let's focus on oral emulsions. And let me ask you, so we got mineral oil, we got cherry syrup, okay? When we make our emulsion is... When you make an emulsion, does the oil go into the water or does the water go into the oil? Depends, absolutely. Can, so you can make it one or the other. How do you make it either oil and water or water and oil? The amounts and the types of the emulsifier. So you'll see the whole thing about doing this oral emulsion here a little bit is your ability to calculate and determine the correct amounts of the correct emulsifiers to make what you want to make. Because you can disperse one and the other. Now realize though, when you make an emulsion, does one dissolve in the other? Is one mixed with the other? No, one disperses in the form of very small droplets within the other. So, okay, so we can do one or the other, and it depends on the amount of, and types of emulsifiers we use. So in the podcast that nobody watched there, we did discuss a couple of different types of emulsifiers. The ones that we're going to talk about, because the ones we're going to do in the dry lab, are the spans and the tweens. And they're awesome. They're easy to use once you understand the little bit of math that goes along with them. Okay, So they're complex esters of different combinations. They're not just one thing, like a specific chemical. And that's why you'll see span 20, span 40, span 80. They're different c combinations of them to make a certain thing. So turn to page 9 in your handout. To kind of understand what I'm getting at, I want you to realize you're going to have to use these tables on page 9. There should be a couple of tables that look like this, okay? So, to understand the different, uh, you know, emulsifiers of spans and tweens, a couple of things. So you can see a bunch of them listed here. So here's a bunch of spans, here's a bunch of tweens, and they're in a table that talks about HLB values. So what is an HLB value? What does HLB stand for? Hydrophile lipophile balance. That is how much water-loving hydrophile versus how much lipid-loving lipophile are these products, okay? So, and since it's HLB, the, the numbering system they came up with went from zero to 20, okay, the highest number is 20, and since it's, what's the first letter? H, what does the H stand for? Hydrophile, so the higher the number, the more the H. The lower the number, the more the L. Because remember, it's a balance between the hydrophile part and the lipophile balance. So the higher the number, the more hydrophilic it is, the more lower the number, the more lipophilic it is. All right? 
So with that in mind, you can see the spans and the tweens. How are you going to remember which one's the lipophilic, which one's more the waterphilic, or the hydrophilic, I should say. Um, tween. What's the second letter in tween? Wuh, wuh, wuh. What's another word that has wuh, w in it? Wuh. Water. So the one with the W then the water is the one that likes the water. So the tweens, as you can tell, have the higher numbers. They're definitely the more hydrophilic, remember the W. The spans without the W are the ones that are more lipophilic, and you can see they have a lower HLB value. All right? And again, there's various combinations of these, and we'll talk about why you might need different types of HLB values within each family here in a minute. But that's an important idea. So there's a bunch of different specific formulations of uh, emulsifiers designed to have a certain HLB value, and we're going to apply that here in a little bit. But so those are the spans and the tweens, okay? Last, and we'll get to this in a minute. The only thing I had to say for the, our dry lab prescription is in terms of our calculations, certainly you can make an emulsion and then use that emulsion in a mortar and a pestle to wet other products, things like calamine or zinc. You can actually mix dry products in along with an emulsion. And if you do something in the mortar, then everything is going to stick to the mortar and there's going to be loss. So in those emulsions, you definitely would want to calculate for excess. But in the formulation we're going to do here, you're going to see Judy's going to put everything in a bottle shake it and dispense it in that same bottle. Would you agree? We're never pouring it out of nothing, so it all stays in there. There's absolutely no loss whatsoever. So depending on the method you're going to use to make the emulsion will determine whether or not you need to calculate for excess. And since we're doing the bottle method, what does it say? We do not need to base our calculations on any excess. We won't have any loss today. Okay? And we'll practice on using the HLB values here in a minute. So the only other table while you were there to kind of look at, so these are the tables of the actual individual ingredients. The other thing you can see that we're going to come back to are the target. When we do need to emulsify an oil into a water base, depending on the specific oil and depending on whether we want the water into the oil or the oil into the water, we can find a target HLB value. We're going to use the specific emulsifiers to get to that target. So that's when we'll come back here in a minute and use this table, but that's where we're going to find our target depending on what we're trying to compound. Okay? So let's go ahead and look at this prescription so we can get to those calculations. So if we're going to read and interpret this, Mark Sawyer is needing mineral oil, 30 mils. So obviously having some laxative issues, so we want him to be able to have his bowel movements. So we're going to take that kind of gross tasting but yet very effective mineral oil. And let's add some span 20 and tween 80. And it just says as much as you need of that, okay, because those two ingredients represent the what? The emulsifiers, so whatever amount of those two emulsifiers you need to mix with cherry syrup up to a total volume of 60 mils. So obviously basically about half of cherry syrup and then the rest of the half is going to be the mineral oil with whatever amount of emulsifiers you need so that we can have a mineral oil that doesn't taste bad and make us gag. All right? So write down the formulation ingredients here just so you can kind of see this is the product that we're making and why we would make it. I'll remind you on the exam, you do not ever have to fill out the formulation record. I won't have you spend time to look that up and to figure it out, but it's important. As you're doing that, let's look up in the top right. There's a couple other things we do need to nef definitely know. And this is something that you'll just, the re we have to know how much total emulsifier. We don't know how much is going to be the span 20 and the tween 80 yet, but of the total emulsifier needed, it can range anywhere from 2 to 5% with different formulations. In lab, we just simplify it. We can't give you a range. Your mind would explode. So we're just going to pick a number. We chose 5%. So given the normal formulations, we're going to choose to use 5% as our total emulsifier weight per volume. Okay, 5% weight per volume will be emulsifier. We'll figure out how to divide those between the two here in a minute. The last thing it says on there that's important is, again, we're going to use the bottle method so we don't have any loss. We don't need to calculate for any excess. Okay? Well, let's look at the compounding record. Go to the compounding record. Let's look at our ingredients and make sure we know what's going in there. This is a pretty straightforward one. We have mineral oil, and it's obviously a liquid. We have cherry syrup, and that's obviously a liquid. And then make sure you understand your span and tweens are actually liquids as well. We've gone ahead and pulled them up into these syringes to make them easier to dispense, but inside these syringes are liquids, spans and tweens, all right? So they're a liquid as well. So those are our ingredients and all of that stuff. Since we're here, let's go ahead and do our beyond use date. So go ahead and look through that list and let's circle the ingredient with the shortest expiration date. Okay. So it looks like two of 20 is the shortest expiration date. So are we going to use that date, or are we going to use the generic beyond use date from USP 795, which says, what, is it six months? Right, it's not six months. That was where powders, right? So what is it? What kind of dosage form is this? Let me ask you, does this contain water? Is this a water-containing dosage form? Yes. 
What do you think Cherry Circus made it to? It's, it's water. There's water there, okay? So there is definitely water containing. Is it used for external use? Or are we making an external emulsion? That'll be our next dosage form. That'll be your gel here in a little bit. So no, we're not doing external. We are doing what kind of emulsion? An internal emulsion. So we have an internal emulsion, water containing. So we're very conservative about this because bacterial growth that could occur in the water, definitely you want to expose the individual for that. So what do we store it at? Well, let me just say how long? 14 days. And this is, it'll be the same when we make suspension. So an oral emulsion is no different than an oral suspension that we'll do later. It's 14 days and specifically under what storage conditions to minimize bacterial growth? Refrigeration. So go ahead and under storage conditions, certainly write down refrigeration. And under beyond use date, put 14 days from today. So what is today? Is it the 5th? 4th. 4th. So uh, is it the 5th? Oh, God, see, I need to tap. off. Anyways, so we're going to do uh, 4-19 of 2019. I should have remembered that. All right? That would be your beyond use date. Any questions on that? All right, let's start on the calculations, man. Let's do it. So on your sheet down below there for the calculations section, you don't have all of these tables. So flip back. I just want to make sure you know where they come from. I don't need rocket science, but go back to that page 9, and I'll walk you through how you would do this. There are three numbers we need to get from these tables to be able to start our calculations. All right? The first number is the target HLB. We have to make whatever emulsifiers we're using to get our product to a certain target HLB. So what is our uh, oil? Our oil that we're doing is what? Mineral oil. So if we look over on the, on the ingredient table, you're going to go down to where it says mineral oil. Now be careful, because again, we're, as we go to the right, you can either make a water in oil or an oil in water. What kind of emulsion do we want? Let me ask you that. <coughs> what kind do we really want? Even if it didn't tell us, what is the purpose? Do we want the mineral oil in the mouth to be tasted, or do we want the cherry syrup to be tasted? So do we want the cherry syrup to be the internal phase or the external phase? External phase. It's just, I'm just trying to make sure it makes sense. We want the oil in the internal phase and water in the external phase. That's the cherry syrup. So we want an oil and water. So that's why we would look under oil and water, go down to the mineral oil and see that we need a target HLB of 12. So write that in a little line that's certainly important. Okay. Now let's go to each individual ingredient. It's not rocket science, but be careful because there's a lot of spans, right? So span, span, span. Oh, here's my span. Span 20, so its HLB value is 8.6. Doing the same thing, between, 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 oh, here's between 80, that's a 15. So write down those numbers. All right? So those are the three numbers that we need from those tables. All right? Before we move on, looking at on my sheet up here now, there is one more calculation we need to do, and that's number four. And that says, what is the total weight of emulsifier needed for this compound? We don't know which one is which yet, but what was our percent did we say we're going to use for total? 5%. So let's start with the total volume. How much are we going to make? 60 milliliters. So start with the total volume times our 5%, which is 5 grams for every 100 milliliters. Will somebody do that math. Tell me what you get. Do it yourself. Uh, get 3 grams. So those three HLB values and the three grams are all we need to finish out our calculations, all right? So let's do it. Now to do that, do these calculations, I have to bring up the A word. And it's not the one you used to describe me. It is, we'll go back to calculations, and there are a couple of A words in calculations, and it's not the aliquot, I won't even bring that word up, okay, that's another A word no one likes. What is this? This is the one where, do you remember there were some calculations where you had a high strength something? and a low strength version of that, and you wanted something in the middle. You're trying to combine the high and the low together to get something in the middle. What is this kind of calculation? Remember you put the numbers and there was the arrowy thing and then you forget from there. Uh, that's an allegation. This is an allegation question. So we do need to perform an allegation. So do me a favor and set it up this way. I did it so you can not have to read my handwriting so bad. But the way that you should, I prefer the allegations, is start with the high one on top. So the large number on top, the largest HLB we had was 15. And to the left of that, make sure you know which one that is. The 15 HLB went with which one? The tween 80, right? So the tween 80 is the 15. Then lower, put down 8.6. And to the left of that, put the span 20. Span 20 was 8.6. And to the right and in the middle, put the target. Didn't we say the target we want it to be is 12? Everyone okay? Then follow the diagonal arrows, and now tell me now, with the diagonal arrows, what do we do with the numbers? Do we add them? Do we subtract them? Multiply, divide? What was it? 
cross subtract. Absolutely. And always the higher one from the lower one. It doesn't matter which one's higher or lower. Cross subtract and follow the arrows. So with the 15 going down to the 12, what is 15 minus 12? That would be 3. Follow the number down. And then 12 minus 8.6 following the arrows up. What is that? 3.4, right? Now I get this big haziness sets in on your minds, some most of you. It's like, well, where do we go from here? So I'll try to help you remember that. These are really important numbers. These are so important, let's underline them. Underline those two numbers we just did. So that 3.4, that's an important number. That 3, that's an important number. So underline it. Does underlining it help you maybe make it look like the numerator of a fraction a little bit? Because the next step is to determine the denominator. All right, I'm just trying to help you remember. Once you cross subtract, underline those numbers, and then remember the next step is to come up with the number on the bottom of each of those numbers. And it's the same for both of them. Okay, that's easy. You got to just do one thing. You know what the, you got to do? Add the two together. I mean, basically, I hate to use this word as well, they're parts. So basically you're saying you need three parts of one and 3.4 parts out of the other, but out of how many total? So what is 3 plus 3.4? 6.4. So that's what goes on the bottom for both of them. Just remember, add up your two answers and stick them in the bottom. That's all you got to do. Cross subtract, draw a line, underneath that line, add the two together, that's your answer. There's only one last step to do. Take that fraction and multiply by whatever amount we want. How much total multiplier did we need? Three grams, right? So multiply that by three grams, multiply that by three grams, and you're done. And remember, we'll go ahead and do that. And each answer follows with each other. See what you get. Round it to one decimal point, just so we have the same number. Make life a little easier. Do that, I do that, I get it. Did you get my numbers? I got 1.6 for the tween 80 and 1.4 for the span 20. And those are in grams. Does 1.6 plus 1.4 equal 3? That would be the total altogether, and we've now proportioned that. So to be honestly with you, you could have chosen any spans and tweens. To do this correctly, to make any formulation you want, whatever you have, you need one tween who has an HBL what? Greater than 12 in this case, and you need one span that has an HLB less than 12. You can make any combination of those as long as you have one that's above it and one that's below it. You can find in a combination of the two that gets to whatever target that you want. So that's all we're doing in this case. So they're actually, once you kind of understand that, if you feel comfortable with that calculation, these are really easy. Because now, let's fill out our compounding record. We don't got nothing to do. This is an easy thing to make. Let's go back to the compounding record. Somebody tell me, what is our target amount for mineral oil? 30 milliliters, that's what it says in the prescription. We know that's what we're going to do. All right, what is our target amount for span 20? We just said it was 1.4 grams. Our target for the tween 80, we said it's 1.6 grams. The only thing that's a little bit different here is the cherry syrup. You know, here's the deal. Are we going to add 30 mils of cherry syrup? Close, but we need to account for the volume of the emulsifiers. Would you agree? So we need the 30 mils of the oil. And then it's the rest of the volume after the emulsifiers that will be the cherry syrup. So what I suggest you do is under actual, just put QS 30 milliliters. I know the total will be QS up to 60, but of the cherry syrup, you're adding a total up to 30 mils. So it may be probably not exactly 30 mils, but it'll be close to up to 30 milliliters of the cherry syrup. So I think that's probably the best way to document the volumes for each of those. Okay? Any questions on that? All right, well, so let's go to the procedure here, and as Judy comes up to do this, let me get things switched over. If you make emotion, it doesn't take more than five minutes. It's very quick. However, with the bottle method, there are a little key things. You don't want to make a mistake, because if you do, then you have to repeat all over again. All right, so step number one, Probably the easiest. We are going to transfer 30 ml of mineral oil into a. Don't count. <laughs> a bottle. A bottle. So she is pouring 30 milliliters into a bottle. Two things I wanted to ask you about. So, what is the bottle? How many ounces are we dispensing total? What's our final volume? 60 mils. So, how many ounces is that? So, is this a two ounce bottle? 
Uh, it's not. That's what Judy was trying to get at. She's chosen a three ounce bottle. Why? Because what are you going to have to do with a suspension or an emulsion every time you use it? Shake it up. And again, from the very beginning, if you have it all the way filled up into the neck of that bottle, it's not going to have room to shake. So we want an oversized bottle. So that's why it is a three ounce bottle. Last thing, and I'll stop interrupting Judy. Why did we add the mineral oil first? Couldn't we add the cherry syrup and then add the mineral oil? Or you could. You, I mean, so I want to make sure. you reading the procedure, and the procedure tells you to do mineral oil, but why? What did we choose to put into the bottle first? Which phase? Think about it. There's mineral oil and cherry syrup. Which one, which one is which? Which is the internal phase? Oil. The oil and water. So oil is the internal phase. So when you formulate these, you start with the internal phase, not just the oil. We start with the internal phase and all of the emulsifiers so that they're in high concentration in the internal phase so that when you do add the external phase and shake it, those concentrations will help disperse that internal phase. So the procedure here is internal phase, emulsifiers, external phase. Okay, so we have two emulsifiers. Emulsifier here. Um, one is twin eighty. The other is span twenty. All right, twin eighty is the one has a higher HLB value. Was it fifteen? Was it? And this one has a lower uh, HLB value. And by looking at visually, you can tell that this is more water looking, and this is more oil looking. That's why it has higher HLB value. This has low HLB value. All right. So let's start with twin eighty. What's nice here is I can just shoot my emulsifier into the bottle directly. Be carefully it, placed into the bottle. I can carefully place the emulsifier into the bottle. <laughs> the only problem is if I overshoot, then I have to start all over again. All right, so let's start with 280. What is my target weight for 280? 1.6. So can you weigh a liquid? That's what we're doing. Instead of trying to measure it by volume and using density to convert and all that, measure it by volume. We are going to measure a liquid by weight. It's just needs to do it carefully so that we don't overshoot. Good. That's good. All right, so under actual for your tween 80, your actual would be 1.61, we move to 3, we'll say 1.613 grams for your actual for tween 80. All right, here comes your spend 20. This one is a bit harder because it's more viscous. So let's see how much I can get out. I, I do have to push pretty hard. Is your target? As I'm getting close, I probably want to slow down. All right, so actual for the span 20 is 1.402, and we need you to tell everyone from Thursday Lab that it was no problem. I wasn't able uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We may have had a little problem on Thursday. So let's just say if it did overshoot and you got too much in, what would you have to do at this point? Restart on everything. But we didn't have that problem, right? So we're awesome here. But what ha So what would be a safer way of doing this? I just want to realize, you know, this was a little bit of a gamble because truly, if it goes over, you have to restart all over again. We did that for your sake of time. If you wanted to do it right, what you would do is take a separate syringe, tear it on the balance, take that syringe, suck up the fluid, and weigh that separate syringe. And again, add or subtract until it's the right weight. Then you can take that syringe and squish it all into the bottle. So you can pre-weigh it in a different syringe so you don't accidentally overdo it. So there are ways to avoid that problem. And yeah, Larry and I did discuss whether we should do that way. And I said, no, it's me. I can do it. And then Thursday afternoon, I, boom, overshoot it. <laughs> but everybody was happy to see that. <laughs> all right, so you want to shake really well. At this point, your emulsifier will work with the oil droplets. You are form, forming something called a micelle. It's really tiny, you cannot see it, but it looks like a creamy in the end. Okay, so a vigorous shaking. And at this point, we are ready to add the external phase, which is a syrup with a sheriff flavor. Yeah, sheriff. I'm gonna QS to the volume that we are dispensing to the patient. Now, as she's doing that, can she use the markings on the bottle, or do we need to use a graduated cylinder? This is accurate as a graduated cylinder. 
Yeah, it is to the actual markings on the bottle. They have tested that. So if you pour to a distinct marking on the bottle, you can use that for your measuring. You can't go between two markings and assume that's like 35. You can't do that. But as long as you're using the markings on the bottle, they are accurate. There's no problem with them. Okay, so after vigorous shaking, it looked like that. And this is the bottle we made from yesterday, for example. It's kind of all separated out already with three layers, liquid oil and emulsified in between. All right, so if you put them together, there's a big difference between them, right? And even the one we made in the morning, it's starting, two phases to, yeah, from here, it's starting to separate already. That means shake well is definitely the one of the auxiliary ones. Put it on there. Now let's take Why, you can set it up for you this time. Oh, oh, <laughs> I did not see that. Thank you. All right, so let's pour some out to see how so, good. You need to go to your QA section. Now we're jumping out a little bit. We're going to need to describe this. This is your product description appearance. So let's describe that. If I can get it to focus. All right, somebody give me a color. A different color. <laughs> okay. You may want to check on your cataracts. All right, so. No. Uh, can somebody give me the color of this product? I should have been more specific, thank you. Pink, light red, pink, let's call it pink, all right? So it is a pink, we need to describe the color, all right? So write this down, humor me here, we keep moving, pink. And then, would you agree, before we shook it, compared to what Judy showed you before, it was clear, right? It was translucent? Is this clear and translucent? No, so let's describe it as opaque. It is a pink, opaque, okay? Um, the next thing would be to come over here and let's give it a good whiff. Pleasant smell, and I can smell it because it's cherry flavored. There's a cherry scent, so let's call it pleasant smelling, or you could call it cherry smelling if you want. We do have an odor associated with that. Okay, we'll call it pleasant smelling emulsion. We're not done. So we have a pink, opaque, pleasant smelling emulsion, okay, with no visible droplets. Can you see any of that oil floating around separate, or does it all look nice and homogenous? I don't see any visible droplets, and what you can't tell, just humor me on this, that redisperses with shaking, okay? So you want to make sure that it's easily redispersible because it will separate. I'll talk about that here in a second. So in the end, I have a pink, opaque, pleasant smelling emulsion with no visible droplets that is easily redispersed. That is an excellent detailed description of an emulsion. All right. So thank you, Judy, for that. Let me get things back up to here. And there we go. All right. So uh, since we brought it up, is it is normal for you have to shake it up each time. Will it separate over time? Yes. What is that process called? Those of you that didn't, or no one watched the video. So on the podcast, it did kind of discuss two things. It is a normal process. It's called creaming. So when the two phases of an emulsion separate, it's called creaming. Which one goes to the top? Which one goes to the bottom? Is it the oil on the bottom or the oil on the top? Which one is it? It depends on the density. It, totally, with the denser of the liquids will go to the bottom, the less dense ones go to the top. So it could be either one on either situation. But uh, here's the deal. Even though they separate, essentially there's still enough emulsifier present so that when you shake it, it will redisperse that internal phase into the external phase and you should get it look just like it did before. Okay? But what happens though over time, if it really is an old one, or if you didn't quite put enough emulsifier in it, what can happen is that those little bitty droplets, even though they cream and separate, they start to come together. And two little droplets become one medium droplet, right? And now you get two medium droplets come together and you get one big droplet. And so when, you do, you, when those form, when you start getting these droplets that come together to form larger droplets, there won't be enough emulsifier to emulsify those. That's called when the, that's cracking the emulsion. An emulsion is cracked when the two phases will no longer shake and come back together. And that happens when too much of the, the smaller particles have come together and coalesced. So don't get the creaming confused with coalescing. Creaming is the normal separation. Coalescing is the droplets coming together to form larger droplets, and that's no good because if they form too large of a droplet, it won't go back into, uh, won't redisperse. So that would be the problem. All right, let's finish up your documentation here. So uh, we've talked about the description here. You would have to check the bottle and verify the final volume, and it was exactly 60 mils. So go ahead and put 60 mils down for the product volume. We've done the description, we've done the beyond use state. Remind you the container closure system was a three ounce prescription bottle. It is important to clarify that it was an oversized. And hopefully you do have refrigerate down under the storage conditions. Does everyone have the documentation done? 
Went on to the last couple of pieces here. The drug name is a little bit weird on this. You could have done this more than one way, but we certainly want to, uh, A, include the amount of mineral oil, since that's the active ingredient. Now, is the cherry syrup an active ingredient or an inactive ingredient? It's a kind of an inactive ingredient, but what was the purpose of this whole emulsion? Was to flavor the oil, right? So you don't want to leave it off. So in one sense, what we said is that this is mineral oil, 30 mils, in a flavored, in 60 mils, flavored oral emulsion. So we did want to include that it was flavored. You could have included cherry. It wouldn't have been good just to say that this is mineral oil, 30 mils and 60 mils. Then that doesn't tell you what the point of the formulation was, which is to make it flavored. So anyways, and I will say it is not just an emulsion because how can emulsions be applied? Topically, ophthalmically, you can do all sorts of emulsion. So this is an oral emulsion. So realize we always include that descriptor with the dosage form. And it should make sure that our final required auxiliary stickers are shake well every time and keep in the refrigerator. All right? Any questions on that? Why didn't we have you make one of those? Damn easy, right? This is easy. Once you got the math done, the preparations of these are a piece of cake. So that's why we had Judy do it. You are going to make something a little more challenging to make. So let's talk about your wet lab prescription, which is not an oral emulsion, but a topical gel. So believe it or not, your gel that you're making actually is a micro emulsion. So that's why they're tied together. And we'll get to that here in a minute. So I think you all know what a gel is. It's a semi-solid dosage form where you put your drugs and chemicals essentially in this jelly-like consistency. It's semi-solid. You can rub it onto the skin. It'll stay there. But what is the advantage? If you had to think about a jelly or a gel versus a uh, ointment, what comes to your mind? They're both semi-solids, right? Stiff that you can put on your skin. Do gels seem like they are going to be more clear? that they're going to rub into the skin better, hydrate the skin and be water washable, whereas ointments, as we'll talk about, you know, are occlusive, they're slimy, they're greasy, they're not water washable. So again, we're talking about a gel, semi-solid, but it's got water in it, certainly. It's clear, usually, and it, it rubs in and, and so forth, okay? That description, though, is not of all gels. That's a hydrogel, okay? So let's take a classic one. We're coming to summer, right? What is the classic hydrogel you're going to be selling to all of your sunburn people? Aloe vera gel, right? So aloe vera gel, have you seen that? It's sometimes usually crystal clear, right? Sometimes they'll color it green or blue just for fun, I guess. But anyway, so you got that gel that you can apply the aloe vera right onto your skin. And that's basically a hydrogel. It's when you take either water and or alcohol, mix them together to solubilize your drug, and then put it into a gelling agent like paloxamer or a carbomer. It's usually, then usually your uh, aloe vera gels are in carbomer, okay? And it's just a gelling agent. And we talked about that a little bit on the, on the podcast. Um, that's great. However, when we make that, think about that. Where do we want the aloe vera to work? In this gel that we just talked about, the hydrogel, we rub it on the skin. Do we want the aloe vera to stay on the skin or go into the skin to get into the body? We want it on top of the skin, right? So we just want it to set right there. Are there some gels now where the point of the gel is to actually take the drug and allow it to be absorbed through the skin to produce more of a local effect, but not just on top of the skin? Are there some gels now that avoid a lot of GI side effects that some people are sensitive to that if we apply it as a gel can get us maybe enough local absorption to be able to produce effect? And what are you thinking of? Or what are you trying to get something thinking of? Diclofenac, niprox, naproxen. So there's a lot of NSAID gels now for the sole purpose to try to produce local effects with avoiding the GI thing. On that case, where do we want the NSAID? Do we want it on the outside of the skin or inside it? inside it. So those gels are what we call an organogel. We add a agent. In this case, what you're going to be adding is a product, my favorite ever, LIPS. All right. Stands for lecithin isopropyl palmitate solution. It's a, basically an oily thing. You'll see it's the brown oily substance that modifies the skin and actually helps facilitate drug penetration. So it doesn't just keep it on the top of the skin. It helps it get into the actual skin itself. So those are called organogels. Organogels are a hydrogel with an extra ingredient. And what is the point of the extra ingredient? To facilitate the dermal absorption on that. So keep in mind, those are the two. And that's what you're making today. So what you're making is called a PLO gel, pleuronic lecithin organogel. What is P? I've mentioned pleuronic already. Pleuronic is the gelling agent. It's what will give it the consistency. Okay, so it will gel and be a semi-solid because of the pleuronic. It will be able to penetrate the skin because of the lips, okay? And the combination is all together is called an organogel, all right? Hopefully you watched the video. Please tell me you watched the video so you don't blow up things in the lab today. So again, you are going to be making that in syringes and that whole process. So today, as you just squish back and forth from syringe to syringe, there's no loss. So when you do the calculations, and you are going to do the calculations, not me, 
make sure you don't base them on any excess because there won't be any loss unless you explode the back of your syringe. So I'll talk about that, so hopefully not, all right? So if you do though, but you can make the gel and then use that gel to wet solids and to do it in a mortar and everything else. If you do that, then you definitely would calculate for excess. But the method we are using with the syringes does not have any loss. So do not calculate for any excess. So let's look at your wet lab prescription. Let's interpret it real quick. I'll give you some pointers, but before we go on. So Don Wright is wanting. What are the active ingredients? We want to put in our gel, we're going to want to put a cyclovir 1%, and again, you can fill out the formulation record as I'm talking, and then lidocaine 2%. Those are two our active ingredients. All right. We're then going to mix that into lips, which we said is the organic phase, and peloxamer, which we said is the, uh, or is the gelling agent, so that's the PLO components, if you will, and make a gel. The lips is going to be 25% of the total volume. The peloxamer will be whatever is left. What I don't want you to get confused, and this is what's confusing, is the gelling agent peloxamer, or uh, chloronic, okay, which is a brand name. I said there was two. I talked about carbomer. It makes beautiful gels. Do you know what anyone actually listened to the podcast? We had you try to do the carbomer one time, but it takes forever because you have to sift it really good. You have to use warm water because it's a wax and it clumps together and it takes a lot of time to make. So it was a waste of everyone's time. Because they turns out they started making a commercial product called Pleuronic, which is a gelling agent that comes already as a what? Liquid. You are going to be able to just suck up the gelling agents you need into a syringe because it's a liquid. So easy to use. Okay? Just understand that liquid is a 20% Pleuronic solution. All right? But do not use the 20% in your calculations at all. You are just, just realize whatever volume of pleuronic you, you need, you will be using pleur the pleuronic 20% solution to provide. So again, that 20% doesn't really play a role in your calculations. That's just the strength of the solution you are using. Brings up an important question though. If pleuronic at this point is a liquid, how do you end up with a gel? How does a gelling agent gel if it's a liquid? This would be no good if it stays as a liquid. What? It's a thermoreversible gel. Absolutely right. So right now, I said it's a liquid because where did I keep it? Where is it sitting right now? It's still in the fridge. When you guys leave, I have to run out in front of you and get it out of the fridge because it's still in the fridge because I need you to be able to suck it up as a liquid. So you're going to use it as a liquid, but what happens as you pass it between the syringes and you provide the energy and it warms up to room temperature, it starts to gel. Okay, So it will be a semi-solid gel consistency by the time you're done with your product. It's really cool. What is the worst possible thing you could do to a thermoreversible gel, though? Stick it back in the refrigerator, right? Because what would it do? liquefy and leak out of the syringe and everything else you're doing. So what are you going to do for your, your uh, storage conditions? Room temperature, okay? So I just wanted to bring that up at that point. So, all right, so those are our ingredients. The, on the additional information, there's not a whole lot other than remind you, you don't need to calculate for excess, and that the, a cycle of air that you're using is freely soluble in water, okay? Meaning that, hopefully, as you saw, here that your ingredients are going to be, your ingredient list is, do I put, no, I didn't put the ingredient list. The cyclovir is a solid, so you're going to weigh out the amount of the cyclovir you need, but your lidocaine source is a 20% injection. So you're going to be using an injectable source for the lidocaine, which means it's dissolved in water already. You're going to use that lidocaine volume to dissolve your acyclovir. So you don't have to use any external water, you're going to dissolve the lidocaine, or I'm sorry, the cyclovir in the lidocaine. All right, then you're going to mix that with your lips and your peloxamer. I will allow you to do your own calculations because I said this, this gel is on the exam. You're going to have to do the same sorts of calculations, so definitely practice it. I have posted my keys up on the supply station, so by the sinks in the middle on the supply stations, there are keys that you can check your answers with, but please do the calculations first so that you'll be able to replicate them on the exam. All right, now let's look at the procedure in your handout. I want to make a couple of quick fixes to this and clarifications just to make sure we get this done right today. So turn to your procedure and let me make some clarifications. Step number one, circle the second sentence. You're going to do it, I just don't want you to forget it. Okay, so where it says record this weight on the calibration sheet is very important. Don't forget to do that. What that says is you're going to go over and get two 10 milliliter syringes, all right? I want you to take one of those syringes and mark it with your Sharpie. Don't mark it on the outside of the barrel because your hand will rub it off. So I would suggest on the bottom of the lip of the plunger or maybe the part of the plunger that stays out of the barrel, something that won't rub off as you're working on it. But make sure you can identify one syringe from the other. 
okay? Take the one that you can identify, tear your scale first, put it on the scale, and I need you to document the weight of that syringe. Where? It says to do it where? On the calibration worksheet. So everyone look in your handout until you can find the sheet that looks like this. It's at the back of the handout, and it should say on top, worksheet, calibration dispensing pen. It should have a picture of our, our uh, AccuPen at the bottom, okay? Does everyone see up there on step one where it says to write the weight? And I know it says 12 mils, they're not just 10 mil syringes, but the first line is where you're going to write the weight of that empty syringe. All right? I'll explain why here in a little bit, but that's what I was getting at with step one. All right. Coming back to the procedure. All right? Everything goes along fine. Number four, if you look at number four, it says to dissolve the acyclovir in the lidocaine solution. I will warn you the lidocaine solution... Uh, is uh, a little viscous, okay? It's in an injectable bottle, but it's a little bit thick. Plus, if I had 40 of you go into the injectable bottle and hold it upside down, it would start leaking by the third person. So what I have done is taken that injectable bottles and popped the cap off of it, okay? So it's open to the air. Is that very sterile? No, we're not making a sterile environment. So just put your needle and syringe in and suck out the fluid. However, since there's no cap on it, should you invert the bottle? No, I'm on kind of risk management here. I'm just saying just leave it like it is and just suck the fluid out of it, please. And just, it will take a little bit. The syringes, the three mil syringes that I bought for you guys already had needles attached. I thought that would be a great idea. The problem is the needles, twofold, aren't on there very tight. So when you take it out of the package, just twist the lure lock thing and make sure that needle's on there really, really tight. Because the gooey kind of lidocaine, you really have to kind of pull on the plunger and just let it be patient. And it fills slowly it fills so just hold on but if there's any air that gets in through the needle cap it won't go so make sure the needles on there tight suck it up there also these are pointy needles okay I've tried to avoid those with some of you all right so be careful they're pointy needles so don't pointy on your fingers or something be careful with the needles all right so you're gonna use that you're gonna suck up the lidocaine to the volume and you're gonna then go put your acyclovir in your small graduated now your small graduated conical and then use your stir bar with the one mil of a, a lidocaine and stir it up really well Okay? Uh, it takes time. It doesn't dissolve very quickly. So what I want you to do now, listen back on me. See where it is circle step six. Uh, maybe I should do it up here. Circle step six and seven and draw a line and put it before step five. So get your stuff dissolving. Put your acyclovir and lidocaine together. Stir it a couple of times, but don't just stare at it and want it to dissolve. It doesn't work. I tried. Just let it sit for a while. While it's dissolving, go get your syringe and pull up your pleuronic, pull up your lips, and that'll give it some time to dissolve while you're getting all of those ingredients. Okay, so I will tell you those are liquids in a cup as well. You'll get your 10 mil syringe. Take a paper towel with you because you'll have to dip it in and suck it up and kind of get rid of air bubbles and you can kind of wipe off excess with the paper towel. But you'll do that for both of those syringes. By the time you go back to your bench then, give it a couple of more stirs, you should be able to suck out the, uh, the uh, lidocaine acyclovir mixture back into that same three mil syringe. Okay? Any questions on that? All right. So uh, while you're making notes here, just uh, I screwed up. The, the lidocaine bottles there say 20%, and they are 20%. But I retyped the concentration wrong. It says 20 milligrams per mil. So if you want to write there, somewhere in the right, just write lidocaine is actually 200 milligrams per mil. It depends on how you want to do your calculations. It is a 20% solution, and 20% is actually 200 milligrams per mil. So bad Larry, bad me on my label. I'm sorry for that. I did make that typo. Okay? All right, now, uh, here's the deal. I hope, like I said, that you guys watch the video here. So what I want to point out, a couple of full things is, okay, you're going to start with your acyclovir. You'll weigh it out. This is where you get your whatever volume of lidocaine you're going to calculate. You add it there, you stir it, and let it sit for a little bit. While that's sitting, you're going to go pull up a syringe of pleuronic, and you're going to pull up a syringe of lips, okay, based off of whatever you calculate. Okay? So in the end, would you agree, you're going to have three syringes at some point, okay? You're going to have a small three mil syringe, which has what in it? Lidocaine and acyclovir, okay? You're also going to have one 10 mil syringe that is clear, and that clear solution is the which ingredient? Paloxomer gelling agent. The paloxomer gelling agent is, bright, is very clear. The, gr the brown, greasy, oily thing is the lips, okay? So you've got a brown, lippy thing, you got a clear thing and you've got your active drug. So now the question is, what is the next step? You need to transfer your drug into one of your other two syringes. Okay? Which syringe do you think it will be compatible with your water-based lidocaine acyclovir? The clear paloxomer or the oily, gross-looking lips? 
the paloxomer. Though again, on the video up here, we're going to start with the small syringe and combine it and mix it into the clear syringe. How are you going to do that magic? You're going to use a lure lock syringe tip connector. These are kind of cool. Right? They are reusable. There should be a brown vial in the supply stations. Go get one of those. You use it and return it. Okay. So again, don't throw these away. I need to reuse these. Since they are reused, they might have a little goo inside there. Rinse it out. Okay? And the person in front of you didn't use Rinse it out. Rinse it out really good. Then take it, attach it to the pleuronic syringe, okay? Take your drug here and attach it to the other end using the lure lock. And now, do we need to mix these two or do we just need to transfer one into the other? Okay, which one needs to go where? Let me ask you this, it's a physics test. If I take this big syringe now and I push all of that air into the little <laughs> syringe, what happens? Volcano. That's what happens is you get a nice spray of everything as you blow the end out of the smaller syringe. So what are you going to do? You're going to take the small syringe and push all of the ingre ingredients into the larger syringe. Okay. Now, do I need to push that back into the small syringe? No, I do not. It will explode. Okay. So just once you've transferred it all, remove the smaller syringe, then take your lips containing syringe. And before you connect them, there might be an air bubble in here from having to remove the syringe. I would push up just a little bit so that everything's at the very tippy top and there's no air bubble in there. Then attach your lip syringe. Well, let me get a little bit less air there. You put your lip syringe to your pleuronic syringe and you're off to the races. Now which one do you mix with which? Well, you don't matter, all right? They're the same size syringe, it will not explode. So just take one and push it into the other. Ooh, that's cool. Now how do I get it back into the other syringe? Turn it over and push it like this. And frankly, you don't even have to turn it over. You can do it sideways. You can do it diagonal. You guys go to town. I don't care. But you're going to have to mix it back and forth. How many times? Did anyone watch the video? Did she say how many times? 40 times at least. And again, while you don't have to count it, it's not a bad idea because that's not 40. Even if you're in a big hurry, that wasn't 40. Okay? You really do. And we're going to analyze this. So you want to make sure that it's well mixed. Also, you're not only mixing, because it's going to be, you're going to see the different phases at first, but as you keep mixing, the phases disappear and it goes from a dirty yellow to more of a bright buttery light yellow color at the very end. Also, it should what? Thicken up. Remember, it's liquid to begin with. Do we want a liquid in the end? No, we want a gel. So by doing this relatively fast, and I saw some people, some of you are so careful, which is not a bad thing, but trying to slowly push <laughs> it over, then slowly push it back, that's not going to generate the force and the heat and the energy you need to make a gel. So you really do need to smush it back and forth. So keep doing that 40 times. Now, some of you aren't in really good shape. So if you start to cramp up, use the counter. You come over here and push like this, and push like this, whatever it takes, keep doing it. You can't do it too many times. You can do it too few times. So remember to keep going at least 40 to 50 times back and forth until it's nice and homogenous, a nice light yellow color. Okay. When you're done, let me just clarify this. When you make this on the exam next week, at this point on the exam, you would take and you would push this all into one syringe. You're going to remove the syringe and put a black cap on it and dispense it to me like that. Are you with me on that? You're going to have all your product into one syringe. You cap the syringe. And again, you can dispense that to somebody like this. That's how you would do it. All right. But today, uh, so is everyone clear on that? So really the procedure on the exams, everything we just talked about that you're going to do today up to this point. But today we're going to do something a little bit different. So now when you're done, which syringe do you need to have it finally into? It's kind of important. The one that you marked. So remember, while it really doesn't matter, today it does because I want you to push all of the stuff that you make into the syringe that you weigh. Because once you're done with this, you're going to remove that syringe, you're going to go over and weigh it. Remember to tear and put that weight, and where will you write the weight of the filled syringe? On that same worksheet, line two of that worksheet is the weight of the filled syringe. All right? Any questions on that so far? Now, because this doesn't take a long time, and because we've never done it, as Judy said, you're going to actually analyze this product for accuracy to see how close in terms of the drug concentration it really is. So to do that, you're going to then take a weigh boat, a medium. Write this down on the side of your procedure there. Okay. So, and here, let me go back to this. I'll show you this. What I want you to do here, let's change this. Oh, this is my way on your procedure. Get this out of the way. What I want you to do is 15. Oh, this is different here. Uh, put a line through step 13. Okay, because it says step 12 says to be sure the gel ends up on your, you know, mark syringe and away. So you do want to do step. Is it step 12 on your thing? No, let's see. I think that one up here is kind of wrong. Uh, 
Oh yeah, B12 does say be sure all the gel ends up in your weight, so cross off step 13, and right there, write down weigh 0.5 grams, so you're going to weigh on step 13 actually, 0 0.5 grams of your product into a medium weigh boat, okay, we got to do that. And then write start QA, because what you're going to do is once you've put half a gram into your weigh boat, you're going to set your syringe down, you're then going to take your hand out and your weigh boat and go up to the third floor to do your quality assurance worksheet. So turn in your hand out to the quality assurance worksheet and this will be done upstairs with Judy. Okay, all right. So when you finish mixing your gel, as Larry said, measure 0.5 gram of your gel in a medium weigh boat. At this point, you need to bring the weigh boat, also your uh, stir rod, also your packet or your iPad with you and come to the science lab. I will be there waiting for you guys. All right, so what should you do once you're there? You're gonna dissolve your drug into 19.5 ml of water, okay? So the last page of your packet has all the information there. So you remember you, guys you have- You looking at that sheet that should be in your packet. Right, so remember you have 0.5 gram drug already, right? You dissolve that into 19.5 ml of water. So that's a one to 20 dilution. When you mix 0.5 milligram, uh, uh, 0.5 gram of a gel with a huge amount of water, what should you do? This a term called a geometric dilution. Have you heard that? Hopefully, you, that's probably the, something you learned this semester. So you don't want to dump all that that 19.5 ml water in there because it takes forever to dissolve. You want to add a very small amount, about roughly one to one, and dissolve the gel gel first, and then you can dump a huge amount and then. In the end, you can dump the rest of it. So it takes about three additions to dissolve that drug. Okay, if you do this way, it doesn't take that long. At that point, you're going to add 50 microliter of your drug solution into a test tube. That test tube has a reaction uh, has a reaction buffer there already. All right, you mix up and then leave that test tube into a heater block for 30 minutes. The reaction takes about 30 minutes. During that 30 minutes, you're going to come back downstairs with Larry. And Larry is going to teach you one more thing, which is dispensing in the extra pan. So you can see on the on the sheet there, there's a place for you to write down the time. So you want to write 30 minutes from the time that you're done with Judy. And that's why we don't want you to mess with this AccuPen thing until you're done with Judy's first part. Because you're going to have to wait how long? 30 minutes. So that while you're waiting for the 30 minutes, you're going to come back downstairs to me. And that's when we will go through this process of finishing up with the AccuPen. Okay? So... Uh, well, let me sort of clarify this. So, so here's the syringe thingy. You're adding and you're mixing and you're mixing. And once you get to that final part there, that's when you're going to take the half a gram and put it in the weigh boat and go upstairs with Judy. And then you're going to come down to me and we are going to fill up this AccuPen. Okay? Because here's the deal. This gel, this kind of gel, is not a gel that you just rub onto the affected area. Would you agree? An organo gel is something you want a certain dose of drug to get into the skin to produce its effect. So normally it's measured in volume. Can a patient use a syringe to be able to measure out a certain volume to put on their skin? Yeah, but they've got to look at the numbers and they've got to hold it or they've got to, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's prone to errors. So all we're trying to show you today is a different kind of dispensing container you can consider using to dispense something like a PLO gel. So the way it works is you basically take your filled syringe. Again, you'll have the rest of your stuff in your gel in here. You're going to start. You'll have to go get three parts. Over in the bins, there is the body, there is a white cap, and then there is a red cap. So three things to do this. Start with the big body. You take your gel and you carefully add it all in. You do want to fill it to the bottom. So be careful as you're putting it in there. Try not to get it stuck on the sides. Definitely need to tap it as you're adding some. Tap it down and keep adding until all of the gel has been added. And really tap it like crazy to get it down to the bottom. All right? So then, after you've done that, you're going to take the red cap and come as see me before you do this if you have any questions because there's an indented side and a flat side that we call the button on the video. You want it so the indented side is facing down and the button is on top. So what you're going to do once you've all that in is you kind of line up the button on top there and set it in there and then you're going to take your glass stir bar and push it down and push a little bit and then let it come back up. Push it a little bit and let it come back. What you're trying to do is form an airtight seal and have air between that and the gel. It may go down a little bit further, it may not. But as you're pushing, make sure you're pushing on the middle of that red cap. If you push on the edge, the red cap will flip around and then you're dead. You can't do anything with the container and you can't get the gel out either. So try not to do that. So push in the middle of there and push down a little bit and then let it come up. Push down. And at some point, when you can't push it down anymore, it just seems to bounce right back up, then you have formed that airtight seal. So don't go any further than that. Take the white cap 
and you need to just kind of line it up and set it into the grooves, and then you turn it upside down, hold it like this, and push down firmly and snap it on. And it just snaps that cap on. All right. Once that's done, then you're ready to a first prime it. So to prime it, you just make sure you twist it unlocked. And this is kind of the cool part. You use it by holding it over just an empty way boat, and then push down, click, 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 and keep doing that a couple of times till it'll start squirting out. It should squirt out. And what you want to do is squirt it several times until each squirt looks about the same and there isn't any air bubbles in it. Okay? Then the last thing for the whole point of the calibration worksheet is, is you're going to have to tell the patient how many squirts to use. But you know it based off of volume. So how are you going to know? You need to know the volume of the what? The squirt. So to do that, and that's we're just working through that worksheet, put a weigh boat on, tear it on the balance, and you're going to come over here and squirt how many times? It's on the worksheet. 20 times. So squirt, one, two, three, four, do that 20 times and obtain the weight of 20 squirts. Put those tw that weight into your worksheet, just follow the worksheet, and you will come up with the volume per squirt that you can tell the patient, therefore, how many squirts to use. All right? When you're done with that, then, again, I have posted my key up on the whiteboards for the squirty thing, for the calibration worksheet. So go over there and compare numbers. Now, they're not going to be exactly the same. This is experimental. I don't expect it to be exactly the same, but we should be close, and you can kind of see how close you came with that. Okay? When you're done with that, you can take your pen and all of your stuff and throw it in the regular trash. Clean up everything. Get it all put away. All right? Then on the way out, the only checkout you have to do, because we're going to go through, don't clean up everything yet, we're going to go through the rest of the documentation here in a second. So since it's only me down here and you don't want to back up waiting to talk to me, I do want you to come by me. I want to just kind of see your number real quick, make sure you don't have any questions. And then if you're not, you're going to go back up to Judy's lab, finish that up, and take all your stuff with you. Because when you're done with Judy's lab and that half hour thing, then you can just leave from upstairs there. Okay? Does that kind of make sense how lab will go? So uh, what I mean is I want you to, let's go through the documentation for your gel. Uh, I don't know how I ended up back there, but let's do this. All right, what I want you to do is let's write down in the documentation stuff. So look under your QA section. What you need to have under QA will be the volume dispensed. And again, you're making exactly 10 mils, so it will be 10 mils. So go under, under your QA for product weight put, or volume, write 10 milliliters. You are also going to want to, this is where you'll document your weight per pump. So you don't know that. That's the weight that will come off of your, qual your uh, calibration sheet. So that's where you're going to want to document it as well. Go ahead and write down my description because all of our products should look the same. And as you're doing that, I'll try to describe it. We want the color, which was a yellowish tan. Again, we need to describe its opacity. So it's opaque. It's not clear. It's odorless. It won't have any smell. And I'm going to describe it as a medium viscosity gel when at room temperature. Okay? Would you agree the viscosity would be different if it wasn't at room temperature, meaning refrigerated? So that's why we got to clarify, based off of storing it at room temperature, this is a medium. And it isn't a real thick one. Compared to your hydro gels or your, your other carbophol gels, it's not as stiff as that. But part of that is okay because we're trying to rub it into the skin anyways. Okay? Beyond use date, 14 days refrigerated? No, that would be horrible, right? A, the refrigerated would turn it all back into liquid. And we don't have to be quite as conservative because this is not an internal emulsion. It's a what? External emulsion. So that's where we can go to 30 days. So you would do 30 days from today will be your beyond use date. Okay. Clearly, storage here is very important at room temperature. And this thing is called a PCCA AccuPad. So I'm going to make sure we get all that documentation around so I don't have to check it when you leave. Any questions on that? Last part would be the product name and description. Not too difficult, but a couple of important things. Certainly drug name and strength. So it's a cycle of air, 1%, lidocaine, 2%. But you do need to say in PLO. Because does the PLO part to the gel actually enhance or change the drug effect at all? Yes, it enhances the absorption. So we need to clarify that it's not just a gel. It's a PLO gel. And it's not even just a gel. It's a topical gel. Because are there rectal gels? ophthalmic gels, oral gels, so we want to describe it as a topical gel. So drug name strength in PLO topical gel. All right. The two stickers I'm going to grade for on the test would be for external use only, obviously, since it's topical. And I would prefer a do not refrigerate. If you put a, if you said room temperature as a sticker, I'd live with that. But I really want to make sure how important is it that they don't refrigerate it. Extremely important. So I'd want that message to come across. Do not put this in the fridge. Either that or room temperature would at least count for my grading as that goes. And, those are, and the, keep away from children's interesting idea because it's not in a child-proof container. I won't grade for that one, though. I certainly do want the do not refrigerate and for external use only. Okay? Does that take care of pretty much all the documentation? 
So remember, the other things you're going to be doing is the calibration worksheet, and then you'll be finishing up with everything else with duty. So having said that, let's go on out there and get started with all of this stuff. If you have any questions or problems, let me know. Right on.